This episode of Food Psych is brought to you by Nurex. Imagine ordering and chatting with doctors all online and getting birth control delivered right to your door every month. Enter Nurex, a company that's here to make getting birth control easier. Nurex means fewer doctor visits, skipping pharmacy lines, and automatic refills, all for an incredibly affordable price or even for free with some insurance. Go to Nurex.com slash Food Psych for a $20 credit. That's N-U-R-X dot com slash F-O-O-D-P-S-Y-C-H. Welcome to Food Psych, a podcast about intuitive eating, health at every size, body liberation, and taking down diet culture. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and I'm an anti-diet registered dietitian and certified intuitive eating counselor, offering online courses and programs to help people all over the world make peace with food. Join me here every week as I talk with interesting people from all walks of life about their relationships with food and their bodies. And Hey there, welcome to episode 185 of Food Psych. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and today I'm talking with Christina Bruce, a health at every size life coach and fellow anti-diet activist. We discuss how disordered eating can affect relationships, how to find self-trust and self-acceptance in recovering from diet culture, how diet culture shows up in spiritual communities, why health and well-being is about so much more than diet and exercise, and so much more. I can't wait to share our conversation with you in just a moment. It's a really good one. But for First, I'll answer this week's listener question, which is from a listener named Kate, who writes, Hi, Christy. I work as a counselor at a military college. Not surprisingly, a good number of students that I see, both women and men, are struggling with body image, disordered eating, and compulsive exercise. To be sure, many of them arrive at school with complicated relationships with food and their bodies already. But compounding those are the strict and, in most cases, unrealistic body mass index standards required for military service, standards that were made even more restrictive in 2017. In addition to physical fitness tests, students are required to undergo regular measurements of their height and weight. And if students don't meet the standard with these initial measurements, they are then subjected to the quote-unquote tape test, which measures a student's neck, waist, and hips. It has been described to me as humiliating and shameful. As part of my work with students, I lead groups on intuitive eating. As you've probably experienced, too, this information is often met with a degree of skepticism, but more than that, a massive sigh of relief. That there is another way to interact with food in our bodies comes as welcome news after so many years spent at odds with them. Recently, though, one of the participants, clearly consumed by restriction, racked by the diet binge cycle, and so curious about this new way, said, it all sounds good and I wish I could try it out, but I can't. Height and weight is next week. She found the possibility of letting her body figure out its natural weight terrifying if it meant that all she worked for, namely a military contract, would be lost. We talked about the alternatives, more restriction, more binges, and possibly possible development of an eating disorder if she's not already there. And I tried to leave the door open to her, reminding her that intuitive eating was a possibility that would be available to her whenever she was ready to consider it. But the fact remains that, yes, her natural size may well be above the limits required by the military. Maintenance of the weight that her body really wants to be and emotional freedom may well mean that she must reevaluate her role in the military. But it seems so unfair that she should have to choose between those things. So my question is a hard one, I'm afraid. Short of sharing the message that all bodies are good bodies, that our bodies can be trusted and that there is no place in any culture, military or otherwise, for weight stigma, is there anything that I can do? The military seems like a machine that is too big to challenge, much less convince of reasonable changes. And I'm sad to think of my role as one that challenges my clients' capacity to fulfill their long-held career goals. But do I have any choice? Any insight you have or inspiration you'd be willing to share would be much appreciated. Thanks, Christy. So thanks, Kate, for that great question. And before I answer, just my standard disclaimer that these answers and this podcast in general are for informational and educational purposes only and aren't a substitute for individual medical or mental health advice. So first of all, I just want to thank you for being the beacon of hope that you clearly are to the students you work with and for doing this work in such a challenging setting because it really is. It's so true that the military's BMI and body size standards are incredibly oppressive. I've had a number of clients and listeners who are in the military and have told me about the horrible experiences of weight stigma they've had to endure and body size standards that triggered disordered eating or kicked it up into a full-blown eating disorder that they then felt powerless to 
recover from because recovery felt like it would mean giving up their military career. So Kate, it sounds like the setting you're in is tough, right? Because of all these factors. And so you're really doing great things by just sharing the message that all bodies are worthy of respect exactly as they are, no matter their size, that our bodies can be trusted. And that, as you beautifully put it, you know, there's no place in any culture, military or otherwise, for weight stigma. I really love that. And in terms of working with individual students, I think you're right that some of them may just not be ready to go all in on recovery because of what it means for their career, you know? So you might just be planting seeds for them and giving them options to consider. And hopefully at some point, some of these folks will realize that their well-being and their ability to recover from disordered eating is really worth fighting for no matter what happens to their military career. And that if and when they don't meet those ridiculous BMI standards, There are plenty of other fields out there that they can work in that don't require them to sacrifice their mental and physical health, and everyone deserves to have work that supports their well-being and doesn't compromise it. But because I know there are such harsh financial realities that people have to deal with, sometimes that doesn't happen for a long time. Sometimes people go through their entire careers staying in a place that compromises their health and well-being. And maybe also for some of the students you counsel, they'll decide like, okay, I'm going to work in the military for X number of years until my college is paid for or until I've acquired certain skills that I'll need in order to transition out of the military into a different career or whatever. And then I'm going to leave and then I'll find a field that supports my well-being. And sadly, some of your students may not have a choice in that because their eating disorders might get so bad that they have to leave and go get treatment. So there's all these things that could happen, right? At the individual level, there's lots of different ways it can go. And I know that there are lots of deep reasons why people pursue careers in the military in the first place, including real financial need, including pressure from families and family culture and history with the military and stuff like like that. So it's definitely a challenge for individuals to decide to prioritize their health when it means potentially having to change careers and also potentially having to go against your family and your community's expectations. Like that's a lot. But that's why this really isn't an individual problem anyway, although it certainly causes huge problems for individuals. This is fundamentally a problem at the cultural level and at the institutional level. And so I think it's incredibly important for people on the inside to push to change the weight stigma in the military. And I certainly don't have all the answers as to how to do that because I have no connection to the military. But I wanted to share your question to draw attention to this problem because it is rampant. Like there are millions of military personnel in the U.S. alone and millions more around the world in different countries who are struggling with some version of this in their own countries, too, because diet culture is really an international phenomenon now. It's something that we've exported from the U.S. to, you know, the rest of the Western world, basically. And when people's financial aid for college and their careers and really the trajectory of their lives in a lot of ways can be determined by whether they meet some bullshit BMI standard or pass some ludicrous tape test, like, that is not okay. That is size-based oppression and discrimination. And unfortunately, body size still isn't a protected class the way that other forms of identity like race and sexual orientation are, but it needs to be because all of these forms of identity are areas where we can experience discrimination and oppression. And of course, I should add that the fate of transgender people in the U.S. military is up in the air right now as I'm recording this. There's like a pending Supreme Court decision happening. But banning trans people from serving is absolutely wrong and discriminatory, just like banning people in larger bodies from serving, which is essentially what these BMI requirements do. And all forms of body-based discrimination need to end in order for any of us to be truly free, as I'm always talking about in this podcast. Body size, gender identity, sexual orientation race, all of it, age, disability, like there's so many levels of identity that we really need to embrace and allow to be there and flourish in their full diversity in this world, in this culture, in order to really heal as a culture and in order for any of us to feel safe in our bodies. So getting back to your question, I know it feels like a David and Goliath situation with the military, but I really feel that we need to push for change at the at the cultural level and at the institutional level with the military. And again, I'm not sure exactly what that looks like because I have 
no sort of insider knowledge of how the military works, but I know that I have a number of service members listening to this podcast. And of course, Kate, who asked the question, is also in a military institution. And I'm sure there are other folks listening who are involved with the military in some way, too. So I bet if you all start mulling this over, you might have some intuition of how to move the needle, you know, not that it has to happen overnight, but just I wanted to put this out there into the world for all of us really to start mulling over and thinking about because, again, this affects millions of people in the military and it's not okay and it really is causing rampant levels of disordered eating and body distress among this population. So I will say that, of course, the military is definitely like a conservative organization that is very set in its ways. And in terms of adopting new ideas, it would fall into the category of what Fiona Willer called the laggards in her episode of the podcast, episode 157. So in that episode, we talked about how these big institutions like, you know, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and certain universities or healthcare institutions or the military are just so set in their ways because the people at the helm are so set in their ways. And they're just these institutions with so many years and, and, you know, decades and sometimes centuries of kind of institutional setness, you know that they tend to be the last to adopt new ideas or new technologies like, for example, health at every size. That's what Fiona and I talked about in episode 157. And you all who are listening to this are the cool people, really. They're the early adopters, you know, who are hip to new ideas and willing to change and grow. You wouldn't be listening to this podcast if you weren't. And, you know, I'm one of those early adopters, too, out there, like, pushing for change in this way. And all of us pushing for change like this, we really will start to move the needle and start to move the culture to a more size-accepting place over time. I have no doubt that that is going to happen, even though diet culture is a big beast, you know, even though that's a David and Goliath situation too, right? But over time, social movements do put pressure on institutions and cultures to change. And I think that's what's going to happen for our culture overall. But institutions like the military will be among the last to change because, again, they tend to be the laggards, these big old institutions that have so much history behind them. You know, they don't tend to budge unless they're really pushed to. So I just wanted to put this idea out there, put this problem out there for sort of our collective consciousness to mull over that there is this huge problem of weight stigma in the military and it's affecting millions of people and affecting their relationships with food and their bodies. And I'm seeing it in my practice and getting letters from people around the world who are struggling with this. And Kate is sending me a letter about this, all the clients that she's seeing. And I'm sure that there are hundreds, if not thousands of you out there who've had similar experiences too. So I just want to put this out there and let us all think about this and try to come up with some different ways to push the military in a more size inclusive direction, especially folks with like insider knowledge in this area. And meanwhile, Kate, I think you're already making a huge difference and starting to move the needle just by planting these seeds about intuitive eating and health at every size for your individual clients, because I think those seeds, you never know when those are going to germinate, right? When those are going to sprout for those individual folks. And who knows how those folks are going to rise up through the ranks and affect other people in the military as an institution. So if anyone wants to write in about this, if you have ideas, if you have perspective or just want to share your story of weight stigma in the military that you've experienced, feel free to write in to my team at admin at christyharrison.com. I'll see what kind of responses we get and maybe do a follow up on this at some point later on with the podcast. And just wanted to kind of give folks a forum to start thinking about this stuff and speaking out about it. You can also find me on social media. Of course, I'm at Christy Harrison, where the first I is a one, C-H-R-1-S-T-Y Harrison on Twitter and Instagram. So you can also find me there if you want to share your stories in a public space like that there. Okay, so thanks so much, Kate, for your question. And if you all want to submit your own question for a chance to have it answered on an upcoming episode, you can go to christyharrison.com slash questions. That's christyharrison.com slash questions. And then, of course, if you want to ask me any question you want and have me answer it much more quickly, you can come join my online course, Intuitive Eating Fundamentals. The course has a wealth of audio and written content that teaches you the principles of intuitive eating in depth. Plus, I answer participants' questions in an exclusive monthly Q&A so you can work through all kinds of different sticking points in intuitive eating and really put it into practice in your own life. 
And when you join, you also get access to our private community exclusively for course participants so that you can have real-time guidance from me and my team, as well as hundreds of other great people who are working to make peace with food and reclaim their lives alongside you. If you're ready to become an intuitive eater and break free from diet culture once and for all, you can learn more and sign up for the course at christyharrison.com slash course. That's christyharrison.com slash course. This episode of Food Psych is brought to you by Poshmark, which is one of my favorite apps for anyone who's recovering from diet culture. On Poshmark, you can shop from millions of closets across America, which is a great way to make sure you always have comfortable clothes that fit your body, whatever size it is now, at an affordable price. And Poshmark helps you sell the stuff you don't wear anymore so that you can trade in those triggering clothes in your closet for some cash in your pocket. They have a great range of brands across the size and gender spectrum, including a huge selection of plus sizes, so definitely check them out. You won't believe the deals you'll find, and shipping is fast and easy, both for the seller and the buyer, and it's all handled through the free Poshmark app. When you see something you want, you can make the seller an offer so that you can get items at a price that works for you, which is really cool. Everything is negotiable, and that's one of the things I love about this app. And when you're ready to get all those old clothes out of your closet, listing on Poshmark is incredibly easy. Just upload pictures of your stuff to the app, set a price, and then ship them to the lucky buyer. Today, you can get $5 off your first purchase when you enter the invite code food psych when you sign up just download the free poshmark app sign up and enter the code food psych that's f-o-o-d-p-s-y-c-h for five dollars off your first purchase this episode is also brought to you by blinkist these days it can be hard to find the time to write a (laughs) write a book yes it is hard to find the time to write a book i'm doing it also read a book it's hard to find the time to actually sit down and read a book i know it is for me and i feel like the only reading i ever have time to do these days is for work but thankfully there is Blinkist. Blinkist is the only app that condenses thousands of nonfiction books into the best key takeaways and need-to-know information, so you can read or listen to them in just 15 minutes. Eight million people are using Blinkist right now, and it has a massive and growing library from self-help to business and health to history books. I like Blinkist because in less than 15 minutes, I feel like I can get more informed on the topics that I care about but don't have the time to keep up with. They have lots of great books like Becoming by Michelle Obama, Emotional Intelligence by Daniel Goleman, and I actually just listened to The Takeaways for Good and Mad by Rebecca Traister, which were awesome. Right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash food psych to start your free seven-day trial. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash food psych, F-O-O-D-P-S-Y-C-H, to start your free seven-day trial. Blinkist.com slash food psych. And now, without any further ado, let's go talk to Christina Bruce. So tell me about your relationship with food growing up. I grew up in a pretty middle-class, white, North American household, and we were a very like meat and potatoes family. So my mom did most, if not all, of the cooking growing up. And I remember it being like, I don't know, like I don't really remember there being too much about certain specific ways of eating. Um, We'd always have dinner together uh, as a family. Uh, What does stick out to me as a child was I was definitely, we were a member of the clean plate club. So it was a, you know, you can't leave the table until all of your food is gone. And um, there was also an emphasis too on eating, you know, eating my vegetables and sometimes kind of, I don't want to say like forcing me, but yeah, sometimes forcing of eating certain foods. So in particular, I can remember my dad, whenever he'd have liver, he'd really want me to eat liver because it was high in iron. And he'd be like, just have this one bite and he'd like, you know, dunk it in like ketchup so that I could, I was like, that that's doing nothing. I taste that liver. And so I would choke it down and So like barring kind of those very specific memories, it was pretty, pretty standard. But I I do remember also an emphasis too of like, because we had to finish what we would eat, um, don't go back for seconds unless you know you're going to finish it. So, and if you did, like you better finish that too, because of course there's starving children in Africa, as we heard a lot growing up in the 80s. 
So of course, then I was like, well, why don't you just send the food to Africa then? Because obviously they need it. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm full. I don't. <laughs> but it was sort of that mentality. And we, it was also to a, you know, finish your dinner before you have dessert. So we didn't eat a lot of dessert, but it was very much like a special thing. So I don't really remember having like a lot of um, chips or cookies or that kind of stuff around the house. And when we did, it was like really, it was important. Like I was really fixated on it. So if we ever had things like fruit roll-ups, um, it was always like, I want all the fruit roll-ups because I didn't know when they were going to come back again. <laughs> so definitely, I mean, I, I see all those patterns of how they influenced my eating as I got older. Yeah, that like scarcity mentality a little bit, even though it sounds like there was no overall food scarcity and you were fine in terms of food security, but like the the fun foods were scarce. Exactly. Yeah. And and I do have a memory of of going over to kids' houses and seeing like cupboards of just it was just like, oh my gosh, like this is your cupboard all the time? Like they'd have cookies and like yeah, just like all the stuff, all the good fun foods. And they were pretty, that was pretty scarce in my house. So I certainly wasn't lucky enough to always have food, but it was definitely scarce on the the fun foods. And why do you think that is? Was there like a health mentality in your family? Did your parents sort of think that was like bad food, quote unquote? Looking back now from what I know, it's likely because my mom was always on a diet. So I never heard it much from my dad or or I never really heard them overtly say like this is bad food or you shouldn't have this it was it was more like you need to eat your dinner first so that kind of thing these are snacks or they're they're only for special times but I think it wasn't in the house because my mom was always on a diet and I didn't know that when I was young but I look looking back now that absolutely would be the reason why that's interesting. So you were sort of shielded from it. Like you didn't hear the messaging around her being on a diet, but it was affecting how you related to food basically in this sort of indirect way. Yeah. And I can, and I can really see too, looking back how my relationship too with my body was in the same way. So it was interesting that actually not that long ago, my mom shared with me that her and my dad really made an effort to not comment on our bodies or to not say anything about our weight. And that's, and it's true. I don't remember them doing that, but my mom was always concerned about our weight. And I think my dad was also too, but he just didn't talk about it as much. That's interesting because you heard, and I know there's research recently that's come out showing that even if parents talk negatively about their own bodies and not just about the kids' bodies, that kids will pick that up. Like kids, you know, internalize that as meaning something like you have to police your body size or you have to worry about what your body looks like. Yes. I just saw that actually. I think that piece of research just came out not too long ago and it really struck that chord with me because I was like, oh my goodness, that's what happened. It's like they didn't overtly talk to me about my body that way. But I mean, I did not have a, a great relationship with my body growing up, or I was at least there was always this insecurity around it. And I can see I probably picked that up from being in a family. And it wasn't just my mom, like it was all the women in my family too. None of the women in my family are thin. They're all in naturally larger bodies, but spent their entire lives trying to make their bodies smaller. So I definitely picked up that message strong as a kid. Yeah, that makes so much sense. Because of course, if someone is in a larger body and saying like, this is bad, I shouldn't be, I need to shrink it. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you're going to get that message even if you're not, if they're not telling that to you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just some memory is coming to me right now of when my mom turned 40. So I would have been, I'm trying to like do math in my head right now, I guess maybe like eight or something. And she reached her goal weight at Weight Watchers. And I remember because this was this like goal for her at 40, she was, I guess, gonna 
achieve this weight. And they gave her, remember, because I was a kid and I thought it was really cool. They gave her this giant gold key. And it was like, I don't know what magic door it was supposed to unlock, like the door to whatever, you know, weight loss is supposed to give you. Mm. (laughs) But she had this key hanging up. And now I know it now, but she was like, and now (laughs) I'm a lifetime member. And I was like, okay, so I guess you get this key like to forever go into Weight Watchers and it's some like big deal. But now I understand why she's a lifelong member (laughs) (laughs) because it didn't stay off as diets, uh, you know, tend to do to the body. Right. Yeah. They, they keep you coming back. Oh, they sure do. So it, so, but you know, so that really implanted in my mind too, that this was like some big achievement that she had for herself. And I was just young kind of witnessing this. And I didn't, I think really in my mind put two and two together at that time, but it obviously had an impact. Yeah, I'm sure these things just get sort of implanted there and take root much later or germinate underground and like you never know when it's going to sprout. So, yeah, I think it's it's really tricky. I mean, I'm not a parent yet. Maybe I hopefully will be one day, but I think it's a really challenging thing to navigate your own body stuff that everybody has in diet culture while also trying to model a peaceful relationship with your body to your kids. Like that must be really tough. Yeah. And I mean, especially too, in the eighties when like everybody eighties and nineties, I suppose, but I remember there, like everybody was dieting. It was just like, she probably thought they probably thought they were being really good, like about not instilling any sort of body issues with myself and my sister by just not talking about it or not commenting. And I think, you know, I think it did help. I'm going to believe that it absolutely did help. But it's really, I think, you know, I don't blame her for what she did at all. Like everybody was doing it. Yeah, that pressure was so intense. And like, I mean, every decade, (laughs) I guess every decade since like 1900 has pretty much ramped up in terms of the intensity of diet culture. But I feel like the 70s and 80s kind of reached a new level, 70s through 90s, because I'm researching this for my book. And there's like so much that it's hard to even detail all of what happened in those three decades because it was just like one thing after another after another after another and like all kinds of contradictions you know first it was low fat then it was Atkins then it was you know just all these millions of different things coming on the scene because Atkins I think even came out before it became a real thing in the 90s it was the book was released much earlier like in the 70s so it was kind of ping-ponging between low fat and low carb and just super confusing Super, super confusing. Yeah. (laughs) Kind of creating this sense for people that they can't trust their bodies and they have to abdicate that responsibility to some outside source. But then the outside sources are always changing what they say. So what do you do? You just like jump on the next one and the next one and the next one. So yeah, I remember that too of people. I mean, my mom dieted Definitely when I was a kid, but not like an official diet. It was always just sort of like diet culture version of being quote unquote normal as a woman with food, aka like quote unquote watching it, you know, just eating smaller portions or whatever. Like that was her form of dieting. But I definitely remember a lot of their friends being on all kinds of different like, you know, Weight Watchers and this diet and that diet and like all these different names of diets sort of being thrown around. Totally. Yeah. Ugh, yeah, it was a it was a rough couple decades for that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to say that it's gone, but it's not. <laughs> but I think it's starting to change. But yeah, anyways, that's uh that's a conversation in itself. <laughs> oh my god, totally. Yeah. I mean, that's you know, the whole quote unquote wellness industry and the wellness diet. That's that's what you know, the form that it's taking now, which mm-hmm. is so insidious and just infuriates me because it hides, you know, it's hiding in plain sight and yet people don't recognize it because these diets all disavow the word diet. They're like, oh, no, we're not a diet. This is just a lifestyle. Don't worry. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's it's dangerous. Like, and I have lots of thoughts about that as being a, a yoga teacher and definitely having lived in that world. Yeah. It, ugh. <laughs> Lots of thoughts that I can't even speak <laughs> <them> right now. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm so curious to hear about that trajectory then, like how you went from a kid who, and, you know, 
getting more into that story of like how you didn't feel at home in your body as a child and then where that led and how you sort of ended up in this yoga wellness world and then eventually got to the place you are now, which is like beyond that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because I remember a time when I felt at home in my body as a kid. And that was basically like when my body just, it, it wasn't a thing. Like it, I was just me and I was in the world and I was like, I remember playing and doing cartwheels and like everything, you, you know, that you do as a kid and, and my body being something like an issue just wasn't even there. And I remember this one moment, I want to say I was maybe around like 10 or 11. My So my sister was, is a couple years younger than me, and she was growing up always thinner than me. And so as I said before, the women in my family, particularly my grandmother and my aunt, I, I mean, I have their body shape, and they were larger women. And I remember um, visiting at my aunt's house one day, and I was like standing in the doorway of going into the living room and my sister was with me. And then we think we'd like just arrived at the house. And when we did that and they hadn't seen us for a while, they were always peppering us with questions like, tell us about school and like, what's going on with you? And so I was like, they did well in school growing up and was always kind of involved in different things. So I would share like, oh, you know, I got this grade or whatever. And was like kind of proud of myself and sharing my accomplishments. And they were like, oh, that's great. And then And I don't know if it was because, like, I remember my sister didn't have as high of grades as I did in school. And I don't know if they were, like, just trying to maybe kind of compensate for that. But I distinctly remember them quickly focusing on and being like, oh, and she's so thin. Like, look how great she, oh, she's just like how thin she is. And I just, like, at that moment, I remember thinking, so what's important is being thin and it doesn't really matter like what I do in school, but that seems to be more important because they're really excited about that. And I just remember my heart sinking at that point because I'm like, they never said that to me. So it was like, that was kind of a turning point, but I was always really active growing up. Now I danced competitively for seven years and somehow managed to get through that without you know, teachers saying anything about my body, because I've heard some horror stories of kids in dance and like teachers really telling them they need to lose weight. So thankfully, I got through that without experiencing that. But I was always so I was always active, like really involved in sports or like an activity. And I think that kind of kept my body a bit on the back burner. Like I, you know, I, I felt like I, you know, I wish it was thinner, a little different, but I wasn't overly focused on it because I was just so involved, I think, in other things. That makes sense. Yeah. So that it was, it was more about what your body could do at that point than what your body looked like, even though you had this sort of simmering feeling of like, oh, I wish it was different. Yeah. And especially then, of course, in high school. Now I was, out, you know, as you are like a, sometimes in high school, like I wanted the boys to like me and they weren't always going after me. So I wasn't considered like, you know, the pretty one or whatever. And I didn't a hundred percent associate it with my size, I but I associated it with look. So this idea of my looks being really important and that being the thing that would make me attractive to a boy or not was really stuck with me too. But then as I got a little bit older too, like, and you know, God bless my grandma. I, 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 there was a period when I did lose some weight, like, and I don't think I was really trying it just, I don't know maybe I was like super active. I, I used to row, like I was a rower and a softball player and those are pretty, um, rowing especially is very, very active. And like, I remember I would walk into her house and it was almost like she kind of whispered to me, like, oh, hello. And then she'd be like, you've lost weight, like in my ear. Like it was this like secret thing she was like really proud of. And I just like remember in that moment kind of being like getting some of this like secret affection from her that that I wanted, you know? And so every time I'd go to visit her after that, I would want that. And when she didn't give it to me, I would think, 
okay, so did I gain weight? Like, what's going on? So like, she didn't say it now. So does, does she not like, is she not as happy to see me or does she not love me as much? Like that was going on. And, you know, this is like all kind of through high school and like early say university. And then once I graduated from university, it was really like, that's actually when it really, when I really got focused on my body. And I think it was something about, you know, graduating and being on my own for the first time. Now I'm going to be an adult out in the world and I'm going to like go for everything that I never had when I was younger. And a, and a part of that was I want to be hot. I'm like, I hate to say it, but like, you know, I, I really just obviously had internalized this message that my looks are the most important or very important. And I want to know what it's like to finally be the person who guys find attractive. Because I remember being 12 and this guy coming up to me and being like, hey, like, you know, your sister's prettier than you. Oh, God. <laughs> 12 years old. Like, it just sucks, right? Like, That's horrible. That was, that was like a knife to the heart at that age, right? Oh, so, yeah. so there was another thing that I was like, okay, that wasn't there in the background. And I'm like, I'm going to do it this time. So I really did it the quote unquote healthy way by just watching what I was eating and like exercising a lot. And sure enough, I lost weight. And sure enough, all the compliments came. And all of a sudden, I became quote unquote hot. Like to the point where I remember being in my circle of friends, there were these guys. And one of them said to me after, you know, like we're all talking about like how hot you've gotten now. And so it really was just like, oh my God, so this is how it is. And a part of me really liked it. Straight up, I was like, this is awesome. This is what I've always wanted. But it was never, because immediately as soon as it was said, I felt this high, but then it felt almost like a punch to the gut because I was like, well, so then what was I like before? And what does that mean about me? And so do I now, and so I felt this pressure, like I've got to look this way or else I'm going to lose all this. I'm going to lose this, these compliments. I'm going to lose this appreciation. All of these things that like little Christina just yearned for when she was like, I was like a teenager, you know, I was a young teenager. That's literally that part of me was wanting that. So I, I kept it up, you know, I kept it up for a long time, but of course I was always in the university. I, I did a degree in health studies and sociology. So I was always really interested in in wellness. And this was what I loved about this health studies program was that it actually looked at health from a social perspective. So it looked at all of the social determinants of health. And it was like the first time that and this was like in the 90s. The, no, it wasn't in the 90s. It, when did I go to university? The early 2000s. Yeah. <laughs> and it was the first time I actually heard them challenging the medical model. Like, it, I, you know, I grew up just always thinking it was gospel. And they were actually challenging the biomedical model. And they were, so it was like my world kind of opened up that so much else influences your health, like your socioeconomic status, the environment that you live in, your relationships, like so much. So anyways, that, that really opened up my world. And so I wanted to kind of get more into that when I graduated university. And so I started doing yoga and, um, also was really yearning for this more deeper connection. Because of course, up until this point, when I was really attaching my value and my worth to my appearance, that's a pretty empty way to live if that's the only thing that you think that you are. There's not much substance underneath that. It's like if I'm only my body. So there was this constant need to like feel fulfilled. And so yoga was my first real introduction to spirituality essentially. So I became a yoga teacher eventually and just dove right into that world, which is where I was saying like is dangerous because you're being taught about that, you know, you're more than your body. Like there's this deeper spiritual connection and it feels like a real safe haven. And everybody just seems, you know, they're welcoming and they're kind. And, and then 
you find out about cleanses and you find out about juice fasts and yoga retreats that like incorporate all of this. And, and then there's, you know, the vegetarianism. And of course, if you want to practice ahimsa, which is do no harm, you can't eat meat. So there's this like guilt factor kind of attached to it too. And it seems all really great. And it is like, I mean, I'm, I, my diet is pescatarian right now. So I eat like fish. I I've chosen not to eat meat that, and that works for me. Um, I don't like meat that much. So that is easy for me to do, but it seemed like the right thing. And I felt like I was doing good, but then I just (laughs) fell into this, this, this well of like, it's just a circle of like going on these juice fasts and like eating nothing. And as much as I felt like I was doing it for that, this was the right thing to do. And this was going to make me kind of more spiritual or feel more connected to myself. It just actually reinforced this idea that, well, now I'm a yoga teacher. And if I want to be seen as like somebody that's teaching wellness, I better look the part And so I was really afraid of gaining weight as a yoga teacher. So it ended up like kind of long story short, it turned into an obsession, definitely disordered eating, bordering at times on orthorexia, like really restrictive with eating, you know, quote unquote clean and no sugar for so long. Like, and, and, (laughs) and I thought I was addicted to sugar. Because every time I was around it, I couldn't not eat all of it. I could not eat all the cookies or the whole box of cereal or whatever it was. And so I thought, obviously, I'm addicted then. So went doubled down on that, right? And went even more restrictive. And anyway, so I'm kind of just like getting a little bit caught in where this all went. There was a lot of things that happened. But I would say I ended up meeting my fiance and he moved in with me. And this was like at the very beginning. So I was still, we actually met at like a a workshop that was more focused kind of on spirituality. And so he met me when I was like in the throes of all of this. And as I kind of got deeper into the spiritual work that I was doing and was started living with him, which was great because when you're by yourself, it can be really easy to just keep super tight control over everything that you're doing. And all of a sudden I noticed like, oh, I want to spend time with him. And that's kind of cutting into my exercise time. Or I want to share a meal with him, but how am I going to do that if I can't micromanage my food? And it started to, I started seeing like, whoa, like maybe I have a problem here. And as I got deeper into like doing my kind of spiritual work, which was kept calling me to connect with myself. It was like, how can I be connecting and accepting of myself if I just really flat out hate my body and don't accept my body? Like there's some disconnects here. So I was starting to see, A, it was really affecting my life. I had no idea how much it took over my life. I didn't know because when you're living on your own and this is your world, you just think that this is normal. But it was when I had another person come in that I was able to see like, wow, this is really all of my life. And when I started thinking like, how can I really connect and kind of feel that love with myself if I harbor so much hate, I was really at odds with it. And that's when, and that's what, that was kind of like when everything changed. That's amazing that you were able to, I mean, it sounds like you're in an environment that really fostered that kind of self-reflection. And so you were able to see it pretty clearly. And also, I think it's like kind of amazing how relationships hold up that mirror too, because I very much identify with that, where this feeling of you notice that your relationship is getting sidelined for the disordered eating or that you're having to choose between the disordered eating and the overexercise and spending time with the person you love and like, or other relationships, you know, like spending time with people you love in general. And it, it becomes so clear, I think, when, you know, especially when you're in a partnership where you live with someone, like you can't escape them, you know, you can't escape you spend a lot more time with someone and you're also so much more intimately connected where they're actually seeing you and with you at most meals, you know, and they're also seeing like how you spend your leisure time and whether you're going out to obsessively exercise because you feel like you quote unquote have to make up for it or whatever. Yeah. It definitely puts a a sort of new spotlight on things that, you know, if you're by yourself and you're isolating, it's not as clear. 
A hundred percent. And, and I mean, I'm so grateful. Like I'm just, I'm very lucky and blessed that he was in my life, that he came into my life because he also was the polar opposite of me. He had no issues with his food. He was perfectly content to just eat whatever the heck he wanted. And I remember he would like leave his food when he was full. And I'd be like, what? How can you just leave of your dinner? You know, like, of course, coming from the clean, clean light club, I had a big problem with that. <laughs> and, and I also, and this was the funniest too, I swear if he could just eat like burgers, burritos, and pizza all day, that would, he would be quite content to do it. And he never gets sick. <laughs> and here I was getting colds all the time and was like fatigued all the time. And I was taking days off work because I was exhausted. But yet I was supposed to be the most healthy one because I was eating, you know, everything that I was told that you were supposed to eat. And yet here he was like burgers, pizza, burritos, never getting a cold perfectly content with like no issues around his food. So I was literally being with somebody who was the polar opposite and it was a shock. And so I think seeing that also helped kind of wake me up out of this and every, this trance that I was in about which was a hundred percent diet culture, this diet mentality. But he was also just, he never said anything to me about it, but he just said, I, I just want you to be happy. And I see you. Well, actually, you know what? Now that I'm thinking about this as I'm talking about, I'll tell you another side to it. He did tell me later that he's not sure our relationship would have lasted if I would have kept doing what I was doing. Because there came a point, like, and here, here I'm convenient, <laughs> conveniently forgetting this for a portion <laughs> of it. <laughs> I would come home. So when he first came, so he immigrated to Canada from Argentina. And so he wasn't working to start. So things, it was really nice. I had like an at-home cook and cleaner for a while. So he would, he would be responsible for dinners. And he would say like, like I do remember, if, if dinner wasn't ready immediately when I came home, I would lose it. And because I was starving, I was so hungry. And I would just blow up at him, like yell, because food wasn't ready. And my moods were so up and down. And I would weigh myself, like I got to a point at the end when I was really doubling down. So anyways, oh yeah, so when I started lo- lo- quote unquote loosening it up, when he moved in with me because I wanted to like enjoy time with him, I started to put on some weight because in order, because my body does not want to be thin. So I literally was like keeping a beach ball held underwater. The moment I give any slack, that thing was going to shoot right up. And that's what happened with my weight. So I had to be hyper vigilant about it. And I started weighing myself every day. And he said, like, I would just dread you coming out of the bathroom in the morning after you'd weigh yourself because I'd have no idea. Is this this going to be a good day or is this going to be a bad day? Because that's how much it affected my moods. And so he said, he's like, you know, he tells me this like three years later. He said, I don't know if we would be together if you were still in that mode because it was like walking on eggshells around you. And I didn't know, right? Like I didn't know because when it was just myself, I could hide like my moods maybe from other people. But he, I I was with him all the time. So he was going to get me when I was crying my eyes out on the bed because I gained a little bit of weight and that wasn't healthy. That wasn't feeling good. It's so interesting how they tell you, right? Diet culture tells you that like the way to be happy, successful, loved, accepted, appreciated, whatever, like the way to all these things that you want is to shrink your body and be thin or eat quote unquote perfectly, like eat clean, all this bullshit, right? And like the reality becomes so stark when you actually see how it affects your life and affects your relationships that this thing, this lie that you were sold is actually the polar opposite of the truth and that the dieting behavior, the diet culture behavior that you're engaging in is literally directly harming your relationship and directly taking away from the things that you were promised. Totally. Totally. And like, the thing is, is that the, in diet culture, 
what we really get and what we're seeking is that external appreciation and praise from people. And that's so stressful to try to keep up. So I remember like when I was active too, I would get some comments at work like, oh, you've lost weight. And then again, you know, I'd have that moment of like, oh, yay, I guess I'm looking good. And then fear would just kick in. Got to make sure I, I keep the, and I wasn't conscious of it. See, this is me looking back, right? Like, like I have moments of thinking about it. Like I, I would be like, okay, I, I better keep this weight off. But when I look back now, like, I was so stressed and stress ain't really good for your health. (laughs) It's really bad when you're chronically stressed and dieting is chronic stress. It's like a hum under the surface of life. I say that's what it is. It's so subtle, but yet that's what's happening when you have to be hypervigilant all the time about what you eat. So when I was with my fiance at the time, he you know, he's so loving. I'm very lucky to be in the relationship with him. So loving, so accepting. But it came to a point where I don't know what it was. I I think actually what ended up happening was one day I was looking, doing a search, how not to emotionally eat. And I came across Isabel Fox and Duke's website. She has great SEO for that. I feel like she's really like, (laughs) thank God, you know, because she can capture people who are in that place and like desperate and actually need what she's giving instead of what diet culture is selling. Yeah, I got to connect with her on that, how she does that. But thank God for that, because I remember firstly coming across it. And that was actually my first sort of seed that was planted. But I remember looking at it and saying, oh, I can't do that. Oh, what? No dieting? Are you kidding me? Like, I I can't control my weight this way. Sounds great. Sounds great in theory, but I can't do it. But it's what got me more open. And I started coming across more and more stories of people who were fitness professionals or fitness models. And they were like, and actually I was anorexic and I was deeply unhappy and unhealthy, but you wouldn't know it because I quote unquote looked fit. So I started hearing these stories and started seeing like more of myself in it. And that's when I came across health at every size at this time. And I started reading it and that's why I came across your podcast. Thank God for your podcast and just started absorbing this information. And I finally just, I remember like standing in my apartment one day with my fiance saying like, that's it. I have to stop. Like I, I'm cold turkey. I'm stopping dieting. Like that's it. I got rid of my scale. I tried to get rid of my scale like years, like three, three times. <laughs> but it took it took this to finally get rid of the last one. But I said I'm going to stop, and I just dove headfirst into anything I could find that was body positivity. And that's when I found intuitive eating. I just listened to podcast episodes of everything I can find. And just that's what really like started to carry me through to get me to the point where I was like, and that was a, a good, you know, two and a half, three years of it. But it took that and it, and it was a huge emotional roller coaster because I was hitting, I was coming up against then all of the fears, all of the insecurities everything that made me want to die in the first place, all of these feelings of not good enough and like thinking that I was only worthy and worth it if I was in a thin body. But I was able to thankfully through, you know, many different ways, thankfully at this stage, like I had a very regular meditation practice. Like I got deeper into, I was doing regularly a, a process, I don't know if you've heard of it, it's called the work of Byron Katie, uh, where you question beliefs that cause you stress. And so I used those tools and slowly but surely I, I was working with a coach, was able to, you know, get to a point where through the weight gains, you know, through the different size changes, where I really started getting roots and, and said, you know, it has nothing to do with my size. I don't care. Like, and actually at one point I went back to dieting for a week. (laughs) That's how long it lasted. And I, I so clearly saw it was like, I walked back into a cage and said, okay, I'm going to do this. And I was like, oh, wow, this is restrictive. And I was like, no, not, no, 
you just can't do it. Like I, I, I like rationalized it with myself. Eh? Like I was debating. I thought, well, maybe if I do, I'll, I'll increase my calorie limit to like this much. That's a health. That's more, that's way more than I was doing before. This is fine. This way I can manage it. But I still saw, nope, like the mental space, the anguish over counting the calories, which is what I was doing the constant, again, vigilance, it, it just, I, I was like, I'm done, like, no way. And I was actually happy to have that experience yeah. because it showed me so clearly how restrictive it was trying to manage my weight. And when you're in it, you just don't know. Yeah, totally. And I think that's really valuable to point out too and to share. Like, thank you for sharing that because I feel like sometimes people, like listeners and my coaching clients and online course participants and stuff will be like so distraught about the difficulty of it, right? Like the drama of giving up dieting in diet culture is no joke. Like it's legit really hard. (laughs) And there's a lot that you're coming up against. Like you said, you know, this internalized belief system that we all have and how it touches on our feelings about our own worthiness and our own ability to take care of ourselves. And so, of course, it's going to stir up all that stuff and it's going to be really hard. And I think a lot of people do end up like dipping a toe back into dieting or going a little bit down that road at some point in the process. Like, I think that's a very common, very understandable part of recovery is this like temporary relapse or like circling back to the thing that's hurting you. And I think that's so well said that it actually is a valuable experience if you can be present in that, you know, in that experience and see like how it is actually affecting you and how different it feels than when you are just dieting and you didn't know anything different. Because I think we get into this sort of like boiling frog situation with diet culture, (laughs) right? Where we're just like, you know, we all are just in this like slowly heating up pot of water that we don't realize or notice. And so, you know, we can like get boiling in there without, you know, we don't sort of recognize it until it's like really far gone versus when you're out of it and you can, you know, sort of recover and and have a little time away or obviously we're never completely out of diet culture, but like when you can glimpse a different possibility and be immersed in this anti-diet space and then you go back to dieting I think it's really obvious like that no this is like boiling water that I just dipped my toe into and it hurts and it sucks you know and I don't want any part of that yeah that's such a great analogy that's exactly it it's exactly it when I look at my own dive into where I was right at the end like that was it it was like being in boiling water you don't know it just creeps up on you yeah It's so insidious. And I think what you said about, it's so interesting that you studied the social determinants of health in college. And then, so you had that awareness and then you still ended up going in this sort of quote unquote wellness direction because it's so insidious and it's so disguises itself as like, oh, this isn't just about weight loss, but like weight loss will be a side effect of wellness or whatever. You know, it positions itself as this isn't typical diet culture. This is important and real and spiritual and you know especially in the yoga world it has that component to it it's like you you're making these choices it falsely posits that you're making these choices from a place of self-care but actually it's very much from a place of self-control and so you know it's hard to recognize too in that world it is yeah and and i've spent a lot of time in different spiritual communities too and and i think what kind of blows my mind about it now because i when i look when I kind of look in from the outside is um, just how much diet culture is in spiritual communities. And so like, that's what really kind of get me sometimes is because a lot of times when you go to like, I've been on different workshops and retreats and stuff is you're coming into it with usually very vulnerable or you're allowing yourself to be vulnerable, or you're coming, a lot of people go to these, you know, you go to these things a lot of times. And I remember when I went to a first, like really deep dive into a nine day workshop, uh, like a spiritual focus, like I just broke up with my boyfriend. And so you go really vulnerable and then you end up being in a community where diet culture is alive and well. And so we can start to equate this certain lifestyle and way of eating as, oh, this must also be a part of spiritual nourishment and fulfillment. And 
it's not. And they, you know, I think this goes back way to even like puritanical days of, of like what's clean and pure and, and what's dirty and what's, you know, of the flesh. And I, I just, I don't like, so don't see that now. I mean, spirituality to me is just connection with yourself all of yourself, your whole self and accepting all of yourself. And, you know, I just, you can't separate that. So that's why when I say it's dangerous, like it, it just kind of gets to me sometimes when I, when I know the state that people are coming into these really well-intentioned groups, but you know, diet culture is alive and well there too. And I think it can get mixed in. That's such a great point. And I think it's so important for people to just be on the lookout for that. Like I always say that pretty much 99% of any information you get about health and wellness is coming from a place of diet culture, maybe even more than that, you know, mm-hmm. like 99.5 to 99.9%. So just like proceed with caution and it's going to show up everywhere. And it's even if it's a part of some spiritual community or a part of, even if it's ostensibly nothing to do with dieting or shrinking your body, it might still be wrapped up in diet culture, which is so tricky. You know, like there's people who are like, I want to stop eating animal products for ethical reasons. And seemingly that is a non-diet culture motivation. But then when you live in diet culture, it's almost never really that simple, right? Because we have all these messages around, oh, veganism is this new weight loss plan or whatever, which is just bullshit. Like it's nothing works and including veganism for weight loss, but like, you know, it's portrayed that way in some circles. And it's also portrayed as like, this is the clean eating way to do it. This is like morally correct, or this is the way that you have to be to fit into this particular community. And so like your worth and your ability to be accepted by others is really tied up in your food choices. And so it's never just as simple as, I mean, for some people when they've really done the work and they, you know, it's, I think a very small percentage of people, but if you've really done the work to uncover diet culture and all of its sneaky forms and you're making that choice, I think it's possible. And I have some people that I've worked with. I can think of two coaching clients and one online course participant (laughs) that are in that boat where it's legit for ethical reasons. They've really explored and really unpacked, but like that's out of probably thousands of people that I've worked with in some way. And so Mm -hmm. it's a really, really hard thing to do. So yeah, I just think no matter where you are, no matter what the context you're in, diet culture can pop up and maybe don't, you know, like it's easy for me to say now, but I was very much in this myself before too. But looking at it now, I sort of advise people, maybe don't be surprised when that happens. And maybe don't be so quick to say, oh, maybe I should try this because it's this XYZ person, you know, it's this person in this spiritual community, or it's this person that I trust in regards to this other area of my life who's telling me to do it. Because even if that's the case, even if it's someone that you trust in other arenas of life, what they're bringing you is still just the same shit. It's just, it's just the same thing repackaged or delivered in a different form, but it's not going to be any more effective than all the other myriad diets that are out there. Yeah. And and I'm just, you're talking about that. And I'm like thinking right now of some really well-known people who are, you know, sort of spiritually focused who are out there on Facebook and social media talking about the latest diet that they're on and they have millions of followers and I'm like oh no <laughs> just, mm-hmm. just like it's it's the same thing and what I find so interesting and like why I'm just sometimes I sit here and I'm like how are people not making this connection <laughs> is that but hey I didn't make the connection until now same um, yeah. is is we talk about especially in these spiritual communities we talk about like listening to yourself coming home to yourself, accepting yourself. And I'm like, well, how can you do that if you're following external diets and rules and taking cues from everybody else but yourself? Yes. It's like we talk about trusting ourselves, and yet we don't do it with diets. It's like, oh, but anything but the diet. 
Every, just trust yourself in every other area of your life, except what you feed yourself, except how you move. Like, it makes no sense of like how there's a huge blind spot here. Right. Yeah. It's, it's an area that I think just because culture is the water that we swim in, you know, as I think David Foster Wallace maybe was one of the first to point out, we don't see it because it's everywhere. It's what we've been steeped in. It's what we've been raised in. And for so many people, I think, who haven't had the experience that like you had or that I had where things just got so bad with dieting and disordered eating that you had to come to terms with it. For people who've just been in that slowly increasing temperature water that didn't quite get to a scalding boil. And so they're like, okay, cool. I can stay here. You know, those folks I think are often the ones who are giving these uninformed messages without recognizing how harmful it can potentially be. And they may never become aware because they may never have enough of a personal experience of it to recognize like, oh, this is actually really detrimental. You know, I hope they'll become aware. I hope that this podcast and your work and my book and all the other things that are out there talking about diet culture might eventually make their way to those folks. Like, you know, I'm thinking of those same high profile people, too, that are like, you know, self-help authors and self-actualization. You know, they're all about self-acceptance and spirituality. But yeah, it's this glaring spot where they just do not get it. Yeah, totally. And I had to go through a real process of, of learning to trust myself and to trust my body. And it required, it's like a pendulum swing, right? Like I was so far on the one side. And so when I let go of the pendulum, I swang all the way to the other side where I was like eating everything that I didn't allow myself to eat. Like I remember I ate and sometimes pints of haagen like every day for three weeks. And I was like, I'm not stopping until I really feel like I don't want anymore. And that was like, that was hard, you know, sometimes to do that, but I did it. And I think the problem is that when we do like move and exercise and eat fruits and vegetables and grains and all that kind of good stuff, it does have an effect on us and we do feel better. But when we quote unquote, let ourselves go and just release and, and stop controlling and go the other way. You know, like I didn't feel amazing after three weeks of eating tons of ice cream, but I needed to do it in order for, I had to like deprogram myself. My body needed, and my mind most importantly, needed to know that it could be trusted. And it was so important for me to go through this, like, I almost like I had to feel worse before I could feel better. Because then once I felt worse, I started realizing, you know, then it was like my body naturally, my mind naturally started to crave a piece of fruit or a salad, not because I thought I had to have it, but because I wanted it. So it can be so confusing because it's like, yes, food has an impact on how we feel. But we attribute it then to this kind of diet. So it must be the diet that's making us feel good. But yet it's like we can feel good, but if we allow ourselves to let go enough so that we know what feeling good feels like for us. So it, yes, like it will mean that, you know, I, I don't just eat ice cream all day, but I have it and I know I can have it whenever I want now but I'm not religiously following some external plan anymore because I've found what works for me because I trust my body that it will get what it needs and it will, my mind will ask for it when it needs it. But I had to go through this really murky place of not knowing what was what. So I, I find like when people let themselves off their diets. And then they're like, well, yeah, like I ate all this crap now. And now I feel like crap. So of course I need to have the diet. I feel better when I'm on the diet. It's like, yeah, but like if all you were, eat if all I ate was like pizza for a week, I probably wouldn't feel that great either because I want something different. So it's like, we've got to start to move away from this idea that there's something external and come back into ourselves, which again is like, why it just, I'm hitting my head now about people talking about self-acceptance and trusting yourself 
but we don't do that with food and movement. And it's the same thing happened. Like I stopped moving. I stopped exercising for a while when I started this too, because I needed to know what felt good again. And now I'm like back, I think about, it took me a long time to find a balance where I started to get to a point where I actually stopped and it's into a workout I was going to do this actually it was this morning. I started this DVD I do, or not DVD, whatever it is now, MP3s. And uh, <laughs> I'm like dating myself. And I was doing it for minutes. I was like, you know, I'm tired. Like my body's tired. I quit. I was like, nope, done. Not happening. And I didn't have any anxiety about it. Maybe like a flash, right? Because let's be, I'm going to be honest. Do I still get moments where I'm like, oh, I want to be thinner? Yeah, I'll have a moment like that. And then I know it's just a thought and I don't pay much attention to it and I let it go, but I don't do anything about it. It's just like, it's the echo, right? It's an echo from the past and it's these thoughts and voices that we're surrounded in. But anyways, to come back, it's yes, like food and movement has an effect on us, but we can learn to find out what that is for ourselves. And it will look likely very different from what we used to do. That's such a great point. And I think it's worth highlighting too that your body has to trust you just as much as you have to trust your body, right? It's a two-way street as the be nourished folks say. Body trust has to happen both ways. And for your body to be able to trust you that there's going to be enough and that you're not going to be deprived again, either of food in general or of specific foods that you like that diet culture deems as quote unquote bad, your body has to learn to trust you by having permission, by having that permission shown to it again and again. And so, yeah, maybe that's going to look like eating nothing but ice cream for weeks. You know, maybe that's going to look like just going to town on all those foods that were previously off limits and having a stomach ache because you're just like eating large amounts of those things or eating lots of things that just don't sit well with you or whatever, but that maybe they would sit well in not in combination or not so much at once or whatever, but like you're needing to have that permission because you've been deprived and to be able to suspend judgment and to say like neutral observation, gentle awareness here is that, yeah, I don't feel so great, but also maybe mentally I feel better or some part of me feels better because it knows that it does have permission and that like, yes, I can have the ice cream again in five minutes if I want or tomorrow or whenever. Like it's always there, it's always available and giving yourself that opportunity to rebuild the trust so that eventually you really will have the feeling of like, yeah, I'm all set on that. Like I'm going to actually eat something different because I want some variety and I know and I trust in my soul that it will be available again whenever I want it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm so glad that you mentioned to be nourished. I'm almost certified as a body trust provider, just getting there. And I'm so grateful to the work um, from Be Nourished because I have learned a lot from them. And that is one thing that they really talk about is like giving yourself full permission. And that's why like what I tend to focus on when I work with my coaching clients is it's the the mind, like the thoughts, it's what the feelings, it's what we come up against when we say, I'm going to give myself permission. And then what happens? Yeah, but and then the, the fear, the striking fear that comes in, and all of our rationalizations and all of our like hardcore beliefs that we've maybe grown up with, or that we've been told about, yeah, but I can't eat this. Or what about that? And we start to question them and create some distance from ourselves in that. And when we start to realize like, it actually may not be what we thought that it was. And we really start to move out of the mind and into the body because we do kind of, I, I know like Dana Beamer was always said, it's like, we're like walking around, like we're just heads, you know, like we almost don't even have a body sometimes. Like, I mean, we, obviously we do, but we're just so caught in our mind and we are really disconnected from the signals in our body. And, and listen, like sometimes a lot of these behaviors that we might have developed could have been like coping mechanisms for us. And, you know, if we've suffered some sort of trauma or whatever it may be, so it's not to judge ourselves for that. But we get to a point when, or a place when we can start to do some healing work around that, giving ourselves that full permission is just, it's liberation. And I love that you said too, how your your soul trusts you because that's like that's the place that 
You know, I mean, that's how I want to live my life from that connection with my soul. And to do that, we've got to be in our bodies. Yes, that like body soul dualism is really just a fallacy, right? Like we are, we are connected to ourselves and our souls through our bodies. That's how, that's how we show up in the world. Mm -hmm. And to be able to reclaim the embodiment that is our birthright and to be able to be in our bodies without judgment, without fighting, without shame, that's like really what we all deserve. And going back to your story where you remembered a time when that was the case, that's the case for ki- for little babies when they come out and hopefully people can have some memory of that when they were kids of like a time when they just were connected to their body and in their body and enjoying their body and what it could do or what it could allow them to participate in, in the world without any judgment on what it looks like or how it functions or how it's quote unquote supposed to be. And I just really hope we can create a society that can allow people that birthright once again and not strip it away from them at some point, usually in in childhood or adolescence, or for those lucky few people, adulthood, like us, you know, it's like wherever you wherever it happens, it's it happens, and it's extremely sad and unfair and unjust. It is, and I mean that's why I'm so grateful to so many people who are moving this work in the world, like through your podcast, and because we do live in a fat phobic world and a world of weight stigma, and the thing that you know, I tend to focus on with myself is, is, is we can keep putting this out there and you, and you are helping and we, you know, are helping to change minds. But in the end, what I also really like to focus on for myself is I can't change other people. And, you know, is no matter how hard I may like spout this message to somebody, if they're, they're going to do what they're going to do. So what I like to focus on is how can I really work to find that acceptance that I crave from other people within myself? Can I keep dipping into that well, that reserve within myself where I can find that self-acceptance, that self-appreciation that exists within all of us? And yes, I believe that we want to find communities and people around us who support us and accept us for who we are. I mean, my partner, my fiance, I'm so grateful to him. Like he started dating me when I was in a thin body and I've since I'm in a larger body and he, I mean, he thinks, he thinks my body is so beautiful and even more so, like I was saying, he saw a picture, we were looking back and like those old pictures that pop up sometimes on Facebook. And I showed him this picture and he was like, oh my God, he's like, you look like you weren't eating enough. And he said, I just feel like you're in the body that is you, like you've grown, you're in yourself now. And when somebody, you have that connection, like they love you for who you are. And I think it's so important to to have those people that you can around you or find that support around you and to still come back to yourself and say the most important people, like for me, the most important person that I want to find acceptance from and appreciation from is me. And so I'm going to keep doing that work for myself. And I keep guiding people when I work with my clients to come home to themselves and to be like, you have the answers within you. You can trust yourself and to make yourself your, to find your best friend in yourself. Because no matter what, like we're still going out there in this world where it's still fat phobic right now and it is changing and we're going to make that change. But what can we do to, to find that home within ourselves too, amongst, you know, this external messaging? Yeah, that is so well said. And I think that's like really probably the biggest thing for me too in my recovery, both from disordered eating and from just like negative patterns in relationships and other areas of my life was being able to be a friend to myself and learn to have my own back and learn to be my own advocate. That was really hard to get to that place because I grew up with a self-critical lens on everything. And it was always about like, 
I'm not doing well enough. How could I be doing better? And just constantly picking at myself. And, you know, I still fall into that sometimes for sure. Like I am now at least aware of it when I'm doing it. And I can be like, okay, like let's maybe not talk to ourselves like that. <laughs> let's maybe do something else. But, you know, the the sort of background of my mind these days is so much more like friendly and supportive and accepting and just like advocating for me than it ever was. And I I really am so grateful for that because I think that none of the other recovery stuff and like none of the, you know, my podcast, like I wouldn't be doing this if it weren't for that transition, transformation. Like I wouldn't be here with this career that I have now if I were not my own best friend, as cheesy as that sounds, you know, like I really feel like everything good I have in my life has come from this idea of self-acceptance and self-friendship and self-care that was just so elusive for so long and is for so many people in this culture. Totally. Yeah, I completely resonate with that. And I think that that's so beautiful. And in diet culture and following these diets, like it just set, it's, it's a setup for failure. It's a setup for invoking shame when you fall off of it. And I mean, that's just the antithesis of, of self-love and being your own best friend. It's like, it's really hard to be your best friend when you're constantly shaming yourself. Totally. Like, that's a frenemy. That's not a friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's like a, yeah. a mean, mean person, you know, mean girl, yeah. or mean, yeah. mean person. Like, it's and not we good. Do that. Yeah, we have an inner critic in there and they're, they're trying to like, you know, they're, they, they're kind of well-intentioned in some ways. They're trying to protect us from the criticism, but it's just unfortunately going and not, it, not a, the best way. Right. <laughs> not, a very, not a helpful way. Yeah, it's maybe it was adaptive or supportive at one time in life, of course, when like caregivers were criticizing you and you had to be one step ahead. I get it. I get that that, you know, part of you sort of developed to cope and function. But like at a certain point, and especially in adulthood, now we don't really need that anymore. And in fact, it tends to hinder more than it helps. So yeah, learning to just be like, thanks, but no thanks. I've got this, you know, with with your own mind, I think is really helpful. Yeah, and it's just then our our world just opens up to us and we can actually start to seek that support that we've needed and start to live the life that we really want to live when we have that support within ourselves, like our own little cheerleader, or that space of kindness. I just found is is really difficult when we think that we have to be our bodies need to be different than they are. So difficult and and so difficult when we think our food and our exercise needs to be different too, because it's like, again, like sort of abdicating that, those choices and outsourcing those choices to something outside ourselves and saying like, you know better diet culture, you know better than I do how to feed or move or be in this body. Yeah. And, and you know, the thing too is that there's so much like fear and almost like power given to food. So it's like, yes, like I was saying earlier, food does have an impact on us, but it's a fraction of an impact of what else impacts us in our world. You know, like our, like I was saying, the social determinants of health, like the biggest, the biggest factor of determining somebody's health is their income level. And especially in the U.S., when it's a for-profit healthcare system, if you can afford it, great, you'll get yourself some good health care. But if you can't, it, it, there's a challenge there. And the stress that comes from that and the state of somebody's relationships, or are they, liver, like, are they living in an environment that maybe doesn't have as clean air as it could? Like all of these things impact somebody's health, but a lot of it can feel out of our control. So we end up just zeroing in on the things that we can control, which is our food. And then there's all of these just misconceptions that get put into what's food. Like I was, I was reading the book, The Gluten Lie mm -hmm. by Alan Levinovitz. And it was like, oh, so at one point, everything was bad. And it's like, we've just gone through this cycle of at one point, this food was considered like the holy grail. And then this food was considered bad. And he literally just goes through all of it. And I'm like, we're, we put so much emphasis and we think that we make or break our health with food. But 
our well-being is so much more than what we put into our bodies. And I use that example of like my fiance who three years, Christy, and he's not been sick. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. And I was like, when I was dieting, I was getting colds like every three months. And I swear to God, he ain't eating a lot of vegetables. <laughs> I'll still, you know, get, I'll be like, can you please just eat a green? He's like, I'm allergic to greens. <laughs> <laughs> but it just goes to show like we are nourished. We are, we are vitalized by so much more than just food. That peace if we can reduce our stress, if we can like ourselves more, if we can have practices that get us start to get us out of our minds and into our bodies, that's going to create health for us. Not if we ate a hot dog or chips. Like I feel way more nourished now allowing myself to eat chips and w- whatever the heck I want to eat than when I kept those off limits. And then actually, I get a lot less colds now. <laughs> that I'm not freaking out about, you know, eating like before when I was just only eating like chia seeds and smoothies or whatever, which I don't even like anymore. (laughs) I know, me neither. And it's kind of amazing how the supposed wellness diet is actually not leading to wellness. Like when you really look at these sort of Mo- these ev- this pieces of evidence, you know, like I was also so much more chronically ill when I was dieting and restricting my food and cutting out all kinds of things and trying to do the quote unquote wellness thing than I am now. Like, I, I mean, I still get sick, but not nearly as much. And I still have Hashimoto's thyroiditis never goes away, but it also, it doesn't hinder me anymore. I'm not laid up or tired and falling asleep and, you know, falling asleep at events and stuff the way I used to be. So yeah, it's just a completely different place to be and so different than what diet culture and its new guys is the wellness diet would have you believe. And I love that you have your fiance as like a living everyday example yeah. of that, you know, <laughs> just like, wow, yeah, it's okay to eat, you know, pizza yeah. and burritos <laughs> and like hot dogs every day or whatever. And yeah. like, you're still going to be okay. Yeah. Yeah. And because we're, we're, we really need to broaden our scope of what is health and what is wellness. Like it is not just food and exercise. That is a small component of health and wellness. Tiny, yeah. And like, do we really want to be spending our whole lives like this being, you know, 80% or, you know, I don't know, 60% of our focus? Like we do it because we think, oh, we want to be healthy and live long. But what are we missing out of? Like, are we living if we're so fixated on it? Like, this is what brings joy to you. And like, I always say, like, like, chia pudding does not bring me joy and maybe it may bring somebody else joy but it is not it's like I like to think of it as like you know like Marie Kondo the KonMari mm-hmm. method is like does this food spark joy yes <laughs> and that's kind of my philosophy now for how I eat is is does this bring me joy because I want my life to have more joy in it and that goes to my my food too and it ain't gonna kill me if I eat chips or chocolate bars or whatever it may be. Yes. So well said. I love it. (laughs) Oh, well, I could talk to you forever. This is so amazing. But can you tell us where people can find you and learn more about your work? Yeah, sure. Um, I, my website is Christina Bruce. So Christina with a K, ChristinaBruce.com. And I'm also on Instagram at Christina Bruce underscore coach. And I have a Facebook page and a YouTube channel. And usually one of the resources that I tell people um, to kind of find out more about my work is I have a free uh, body acceptance jumpstart guide that you can download at my website where I give some kind of tips to get on the ground and run in towards the body acceptance journey. I love it. We'll put all those in the show notes so people can find you. And thank you so much for being here. This was a real pleasure. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Christy. So that's our show. Thanks again so much to Christina Bruce for joining us on this episode. And thanks to you for listening. If you've gotten something out of this podcast, please help us reach more people who need to hear the anti-diet message, because who doesn't, as I'm always saying, by sharing and subscribing. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, you can share this episode by clicking the three dots on the right-hand side of your screen and then clicking share episode. And you can subscribe by going to christyharrison.com slash subscribe. That's christyharrison.com slash subscribe. 
If you're looking for some practical tips to help you get started on this anti-diet path, grab my free audio guide, Seven Simple Strategies for Finding Peace and Freedom with Food. Just go to christyharrison.com slash strategies to get it. That's christyharrison.com slash strategies. To get full show notes from this episode, including all the resources we discussed, plus a full transcript, you can go to christyharrison.com slash 185. That's christyharrison.com slash 185. And to get the transcript, just scroll down to the bottom of the page and enter your email address. This episode was brought to you by Blinkist. These days, it can be hard to sit down and learn more. You may think you don't have time to read a book. Well, think again. Blinkist is the only app that condenses thousands of nonfiction books into the best key takeaways so you can read or listen to them in just 15 minutes. Right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash food psych to start your free seven-day trial. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash F-O-O-D-P-S-Y-C-H to start your free seven-day trial. Blinkist.com slash food psych. A big thanks to our editor and engineer, Mike Lalonde, and to my Food Psych programs team, including our community and content associate, Vinci Chue, our administrative assistant, Julianne Watasek, and our transcript assistant, Kiera McClellan, for helping me out with all the moving parts that go into producing this show for you every week. Our album art was photographed by Abby Moore Photography and designed by Meredith Noble. And the theme song that you're hearing behind me now is written and performed by Carolyn Pennypacker Riggs. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, stay psyched. Stay psyched.